Hello. Hello. Era when recognition of unions was fundamentally denied. Um, uh, Commons and to a lesser extent Ely, uh, it seems to me, at least from my perspective, had a problem with class as a category of analysis. They sought, in many ways, they sought harmony and reconciliation in a world where that was polarized and deeply divided and, and in which corporations were fundamentally opposed to labor. Um, uh, Daryl has noted that they rationalized and in some ways gave legitimacy to a capitalist order within which labor could function and be a partner. Um, the conflict between Commons and his uh, sidekick, uh, Charles McCarthy, uh, on the one hand, and Frank Walsh uh, on the other, who were involved in the US Commission on Industrial Relations uh, in the early teens, um, highlighted those limitations, it seems to me. Whereas Commons and McCarthy were very eager to find reconciliation and instruments or institutions of mediation, um, uh, Walsh and his allies were very much uh, focused on workers' empowerment and the defense of their rights. And um, whereas Commons thought about administrative solutions, uh, uh, Walsh and others were very intent on building the right to collective bargaining. Um, and so um, I'm not trying to revive an old battle as, as Daryl has described it between the old labor history and the new. Um, and, and I very much appreciate that he didn't speak to it directly in his oral presentation, but I appreciate his, his invocation of David Brody's efforts to find common ground between the old and the new labor history. But it also seems to me it's essential to keep in broader focus um, the, the work um, that needs to be done going forward uh, that we and, and as workers and as historians, particularly in this era, when workers and their unions are being hammered, uh, need, need to do. Uh, we've tended to juxtapose, we meaning the new labor historians, um, labor organizations and social movements. Um, but the labor movement at its best is a social movement. It's bigger than unions. It includes cooperatives and political organization and oppositional working class culture and a class-based social vision. Um, the new labor history, it seems to me, brought into focus the social history of the working class to ask the question, who is the working class after all? And for many uh, of us, it was organized and unorganized workers. Um, and it was important to maintain that kind of broader perspective beyond just the organized working class. Um, and we ask uh, to broaden our reach and shift our focus to consider subjects that had been neglected by Commons and Ely and Perlman and their disciples. Um, and one of the closest to my heart is the Knights of Labor, which Daryl uh, mentioned. Um, and Knights of Labor, has very, was very badly underserved by the old labor history. Um, it had the breadth of a social movement. It was a class-based movement. And in spite of the posturing of Powderly and some of the leadership, it was very deeply grounded in working class communities and working class struggles. Um, and it seems to me the new labor history has helped elevate the Knights of Labor and helped us understand it uh, as a social movement, as a working class social movement in a way that had been neglected in the past. The IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, engaged a new wor industrial working class in the early 20th century of immigrants, of marginal workers, of the unskilled, um, uh, that was largely being ignored by the AFL um, and was being left to, to on the margins of organizing efforts. Uh, the early organizing of the New Deal era, the 1933 to 35 period, the so-called NRA strikes in Toledo and Minneapolis, San Francisco, in the Southern textile fields, 
um, suggested new possibilities for class-wide collective action before the CIO uh, came into uh, existence as an institution. And it, again, it's important to understand that that class struggle context in which um, the CIO was ultimately born and the, and the important New Deal legislation. And I don't, certainly don't want to contradict what Daryl was suggesting about the importance that the Wisconsin school and its practitioners had in shaping that legislation. But as he alluded to, and as I think is important to keep in focus, there was a popular struggle going on that was giving birth to that legislation in powerful ways. And without it, it's hard to imagine. That's right. Uh, Pardon me. Oh, did somebody say any? Anyway, um, and you know, for instance, uh, there were other kind of models of uh, unionism that were being spawned in that fertile period of the early New Deal. Um, the Peter Ratcliffe has talked about a lot about the independent union of all workers in Austin, Minnesota, that envisioned a community-wide sort of going back to the Knights of Labor uh, model of how to organize. Uh, that drew in marginal workers who would have difficulty organizing on their own right, but in the context of an industrial union um, could, could be important, could have important benefits. Um, I think of the radical union uh, in Alice, at Alice Chalmers, Local 248, that Steve Meyer did so much important work to document as another incarnation of that social movement tradition um, in the labor movement. Uh, I'm thinking about women and African Americans who brought new energy uh, into the 1960s and 70s from social movements that gave rise to, as Lane Windham has talked about, a, a whole new wave of organizing, particularly in the South, but, but elsewhere as well. And then I'm thinking about the worker centers today uh, and the way they embody that new energy. Uh, I'm, I'm involved with the Center for Worker Justice of Eastern Iowa, and uh, you know we're very much fighting uh, with uh, employers' wage theft and trying to defend workers' rights to health and safety and protecting immigrants against ICE and um, a whole lot of other struggles that are not peripheral to the labor movement, but nor are they necessarily central. And, and, uh, and, and, and the labor movement has been a great ally in many cases in, in giving birth to or giving support to uh, these worker centers. Um, so I think we need a flexible approach to organizing workers today inside and outside of traditional unions. We need to find a place for contingent workers and domestic workers and workers who are on the margins uh, and unprotected by traditional labor laws and collective bargaining and, and from the social benefits of social, uh, the benefits of social legislation. I'm thinking particularly of the millions of undocumented work, immigrants who, uh, particularly in this pandemic, as we've seen in our own communities, have not had access to the benefits that the federal government, limited though they have been, uh, have offered and who are surviving very much on the margins of this uh, struggling economy. Um, so I, I look back to the founding of the Wisconsin Labor History Society as a terrific achievement, a, a new direction in public history, uh, a coalition of labor academics and uh, the public that is a powerful, powerful model, as I've suggested. And it takes me back to those early days where for me, uh, the Wisconsin Labor History Society was a breath of fresh air. I was working for the State Historical Society, uh, coordinating the Office of uh, Local History um, and mostly working with county and local historical societies. And although uh, they did good work, uh, they were preserving local history and telling local stories, they were essentially telling historical stories that were top down, but within a local context. Uh, they focused on local elites, on social harmony, on uncontested narratives, and were kind of boosterous in, in, their, in their focus. Uh, and so for me, the founding of the Wisconsin Labor History Society, where it was possible to talk about class and to talk about class conflict and to have commemorations for things like the Bayview Massacre and to acknowledge that that's part of our history and a part of our community's history was so important. Um, your, uh, your annual commemorations have been, uh, you know, I've though mostly viewed from a distance have been uh, really inspiring. And, uh, and as I say, uh, you have been a model for those of us working in other states who are trying to build 
uh, comparable organizations and do comparable work and to ally our state labor movements uh, and local labor leaders with academics and public historians. Um, over the years, the Iowa uh, AFL-CIO um, sponsored a project called the uh, Iowa Labor History Oral Project, which has interviewed about 1,500 workers since the late 1970s and have been a foundation on which the, the new Iowa Labor History Society is seeking to build. Uh, the focus has shifted now to the history of public sector workers to a large extent uh, who face their own challenges, like the ones yours face. Uh, from a reactionary state legislature, and in our case, from a retrograde governor, our own Scott Walker. Um, uh, but to me, our labor history societies built through grassroots cooperation of trade unionist scholars, educators, and the public um, hold the promise of keeping alive uh, an interest in workers' struggles, influencing public discourse, and um, training a new generation of young people who are eager, eager to find a usable past. And we're the we're the, the bearers of that usable past, in my view. And so congratulations on 40 an unbelievable years of terrific work. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Shell. That was, that was a, great, a, a great recitation. And then somebody else, who, oh, by, oh, by the way, if you do want to speak later on, do put the word speak into the chat room and, and, and we'll make sure we pick you up. Uh, Harry Miller was also with the State Historical Society at that time as an archivist, and uh, we've got him to comment on, on what Daryl said and Shell, I guess, and a little bit about our early history. So Harry, unmute yourself and speak on. Okay, well, I think I'm unmuted and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and you're fine. Yeah. Good, good. And it is good to, to see some faces that I haven't seen for a long time. Um, I'll try to keep my comments very brief. Um, I, I, I don't have the academic background that Shell has, nor do I have the, the practical experience of Joanne and, and, and Daryl. Uh, but I did have um, a, a position at the Historical Society that let me spend a lot of time uh, with John R. Commons and Richard T. Ely, and even with Samuel Gompers, in the sense that the Historical Society holds a collection of papers and records of Commons and Ely and the records of the AFL. So I, 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 I'm kind of a, I have some sympathy with Commons and Ely, and I have some sympathy with the Wisconsin School. Uh, because I really did, I, I spent months and months reading their letters and looking at what they're considering what they were trying to do and and to a degree what they accomplished um i think both shell and daryl really kind of gave us a good picture of of the founding of the wisconsin labor history society and it, its reason for being it it seems pretty clear to me that it's accomplished what shell outlined there is bringing together various groups of people um, from, from rank and file to union officials to uh, activists and, and some academics. Uh, in the longer version of Daryl's paper, he talks, talks about the Wisconsin idea and the role of academics. And, and uh, to me, the Wisconsin Labor History Society was formed uh, out of a respect for the accomplishments of the labor movement in Wisconsin and out of a desire to to, to link up with, with people maybe not directly involved in the labor movement, but people in, in academics and, and, and activists as well. Um, and I think the, the Labor History Society shared one thing, or st probably still does share one thing with the, the institutional economists in, in the Wisconsin School, is a feeling that if we if we kind of look back and, and honor those who preceded us in the labor movement, it does also help by understanding what they did. It does also help chart a course. And uh, that's, that's what I, the, the rationale that I thought was behind society when it, when it was formed. Um, I'll just make a couple comments on, uh, on the Wisconsin school and, and so on. 
again, in the longer version of Daryl's paper, he talks a little bit about the Wisconsin idea. He talks about, and he, he talked this morning, about why Wisconsin, you know, why, why did these uh, uh, labor reforms or working class reforms or political reforms, whatever you want to call them, why did they happen in Wisconsin? And, and he rightfully pointed out the, uh, the, the role of organized labor, the history of organized labor going back into the 1870s and 80s is making this a logical place. And he, he, he certainly mentioned the socialists and social democrats in Milwaukee. Uh, I, you know, I, I guess I would just add a little bit too that these things took place during what historians call the progressive era. And uh, the progressive era is sort of the, in my mind, the antithesis of the Reagan 80s and 90s. You know, there's that famous quote from Reagan about government being the problem. Well, in the progressive era, they didn't think the general society didn't necessarily think that that government was the problem. They, they felt that 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 society, organized society, and government being a part of that could solve some of the problems, economic and social, that uh, that that the labor economists defined as the labor problem. That that set of social and economic problems that they gave that title to. And that's really what Ely and Commons and Witte and Helen Sumner and, and Elizabeth Brandeis and the generation, and it really was a multi-generational uh, group that the Wisconsin school spawned. Um, so I, I and, and I, you know, Daryl and Shell talked about the sort of turning away from the Wisconsin school in the 70s and 80s. And Daryl talked about the turning away um, in the field of economics from the institutionalists. Uh, those things happened kind of simultaneously, I think. And in my very maybe amateurish view of history, I think it's a little bit cyclical. And um, I'm kind of hoping that we are coming into an era with the Biden presidency where there is some faith in government to take a role just as there was in the progressive era. Um, and I, you know, I think we're seeing the beginnings of some efforts for the federal government to take a role. So I, I'm hoping we're entering another cycle where society can act through its government to, to change some of so to address some of the problems we have, and that doesn't, by no means, does that mean that the Wisconsin School of Labor historians knew it all or had it all right. Um, back in the 70s and 80s, when when those folks, and again, I admit my sort of sympathy with them after getting to know them in a way that that's pretty hard to do. Um, but I always thought that the criticism was a little unfair. These were a group of people with a certain background and, and certainly they did accept the economic and social, well, they didn't accept the status quo, but they, they accepted the system um, and tried to tinker with it. Um, but I always thought it was a little unfair because they set their own plan, they set an agenda and they largely, I think, accomplished that agenda. Their agenda was making improvements in the, in the institutions that existed and using government to make that improvement. Um, what they didn't do, they didn't set out to do. So I always thought the criticism was a little unfair. If, if it was criticism, it should be for setting the wrong agenda, making the wrong plans. Because all they did was work on what they say said they were going to do, and they did a pretty good job of it. Um, you know, and, and is it really fair to to uh, to be critical for something that really wasn't a part of the plan that they set out, to, or the set of problems that they wanted to solve? Um, and this is not to say that that they knew it all, or that, uh, and certainly the 
the the activism of the 70s and 80s and going now and the, and the way and the things that Shell talked about the social problems that weren't addressed are more than valid but uh, but but as I say I, I have a little sympathy with uh, with those folks and uh, um, you know it seems to me that social order isn't going to change drastically at least not in the near near term and, and trying to work with what we have is, is a valuable asset. So um, that's kind of my view of it. I, I think that uh, that Daryl did a superb job. It's a great way to set up this 40th anniversary meeting by looking back and, and looking at why Wisconsin and where it came from. And, and I think Shell is right on with his analysis of the, the strengths of the Wisconsin Labor History Society. And, uh, it, and it's a great day to celebrate those strengths. Well, well, thank you very much, Harry. And of course you were in at the beginning. So we owe a, a debt of gratitude to you and, and all of the other early, early founders. And uh, the, the next responder is our own uh, Joanne Rica. Now, Joanne has been around since the first, first, first meeting as well. But more importantly, Joanne has been the ongoing glue that has kept us together. And she, is, she has uh, been very good in us. Uh, I have been either president or president emeritus for this organization, believe it or not, since 1992, which means next year it'll be 30 years. And uh, wow. And uh, all this time, Joanne is been uh, keeping track of things, making sure we do things when it's on time, uh, kind of, if I can use, no, I'm not gonna use that term, because uh, it's sexist. And uh, anyway, uh, we are so grateful for her because I don't think uh, the Labor History Society would be around today in the form we are without her 40 years of, uh, of contributions. So Joanne, tell us a, a, a bit about those early days and then we'll take a few questions because time is moving on, yeah. Thank you very much, Ken, for those very kind comments. Um, I just like to recognize the people who played a significant role in bringing the society to this remarkable anniversary. Um, as Shell said, he headed the Office of Local History at the West Wisconsin Historical Society in 1981. And it was his idea uh, to consider forming a local labor history society. And Shell asked some of us to sign an invitation that went out to 65 um, individuals and labor councils in Wisconsin, inviting them to a meeting. And those who signed were Jim Cavanaugh, who's with us today at this meeting. He was with the Wisconsin Historical Society. He was working on enhancing the labor collection at the society. Uh, William Blue Jenkins, who was an African-American labor leader in Racine. He was president of a UAW local and also president of the Racine Labor Council. Harvey Kay, a professor at UW-Green Bay, Department of Social Change and Development, who couldn't be with us today. Uh, Barbara Morford, who is on this uh, Zoom here, and she was with the School for Workers, and she was director of the Women and Workplace Project. John Schmidt signed, who was president of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO, and I did as uh, I was with the Coalition of Labor Union Women at that time. As a result of that invitation, there were 26 of us who gathered at the State Historical Society in May of 1981 with great enthusiasm for the idea of a society. We created an interim board, uh, which I volunteered to chair but Shell and other historical society staff continued to provide key support for our efforts. Those staff were Jim Cavanaugh, Harry Miller, Michael Gordon, and Dale Trelevin. They wrote the early newsletters and helped us create our bylaws 
and file our incorporation documents. And we are affiliated with the Wisconsin Historical Society. Our interim board then began to plan the first conference and that was held a year later in May, 1982 with a great turnout of about 150 people at Turner Hall in Milwaukee. The main topic was Milwaukee labor in the 1940s. Actually, Steve Meyer, who we held in memory at the beginning of this session was one of the speakers. A highlight was the labor history bus tour of Milwaukee created by former socialist mayor, Frank Zeidler. It was there we elected our first official board. I continued as president. Harvey Kay of UW-Green Bay was vice president. Dorina Rasmussen with the Office and Professional Employees Union was secretary. And Harry Miller with the State Historical Society was treasurer. The board members were David Newby and Daryl Holter with the Wisconsin Federation of Teachers, Sue Weibel from AFSCME, Ralph Jerichoic, the Milwaukee County Labor Council, Florence Simons, the Allied Industrial Workers, and Kelly Sparks, the UAW. In the early years, our meetings were held in board members' homes. We took turns holding the meetings. Our secretary, Darina, wrote the membership information on index cards in a file box. She typed the mailing labels on her typewriter with carbon paper to make extra copies. <laughs> Just one example of the quiet dedication that helped build the society. Daryl Holter took over from me as president and served for six years until he moved to California, which was our major loss. Then Ken Germanson took the reins and served as president for an astounding 17 years. And he is still at the heart of whatever we do. We are fortunate now to have President Steve Coperi, who has been a passionate guiding force for 12 years. We owe so much to the dedication of the officers and board members, some 64 people who have served since 1981, and they will be recognized in an upcoming newsletter. It's a tribute to all of them that we are one of the most active labor history societies in the country, and that we can celebrate this amazing accomplishment with great hope for the future. There is no doubt that the early endorsement of John Schmidt, president of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO, encouraged turnout for our founding meeting. He signed that original invitation. John was also featured speaker at our first conference at Turner Hall, and he gave the society the standing to reach the broader labor movement. His support and that of successive presidents of the AFL-CIO, including David Newby, who is here today, was vital in building a strong labor foundation over the decades. From the start, the society has been committed to have both academic and labor communities on the board and represented in our programs. This blend has broadened support and made the society more effective and respected. And most important, the financial support of our faithful membership of individuals and unions has made all of our work possible. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very, can, can, very much, go on. And Daryl, I, I can, can I just respond? To, yeah, go briefly. ahead. I yeah. just wanted to spot just briefly to the to the three commentators, and I want to thank you all. Particularly, I want to thank you for reading that twenty-seven page. Thing that I wrote, which which I know, you know, it was really a more of a think piece for me to get my hands around it than anything else. But I wanted to just say something about the the whole way that we think about things. If you if you listen to what Shell said, if you listen to what Harry said, if you listen to what Joanne said, you'll understand exactly the thesis behind what I was trying to say, which is to say this: if you take what Harry talked about about the Wisconsin school, 
if you if you think about what Harry talked about, and if you think about what Shell talked about, you have there uh, the the thesis and anth antithesis that we've been talking about with the with the old with with the Wisconsin school and the, and the new labor history value in both in, in both views and they've emphasized that and it's there and then if you think about what Joanne talks about there is the synthesis there is the bringing together of the old and the new in the institutional framework so that's what I wanted to say okay thank you does okay if we have time for a couple of comments if or or actually questions and you know keep it you know, keep it short. Uh, just, just, just put something in the chat. Who, who wants to do it? I think, John. Did you say you wanted to speak? And keep it brief, please. John Rivet. I guess not. Does anybody else wish to speak? This is Judy Gatlin. Yeah, go ahead, Judy. Thank you. I'm from way up north, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. So I travel four hours to go to these meetings, which I love. This isn't going to be a quick answer, but very ideology, ideology is this current situation between uh, organized labor and um, the law enforcement. Some things I'm reading is um, it's you know going to be good for labor. Some things, some things I read said it's not going to be for labor. And Ken summed it up very well in a blog. But since that blog, there's been more murders. If you want to call them that, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't call that. But and I have um I have a law enforcer, a law a policeman in my family, and we can't talk about anything. <laughs> so I just wanted to know what, what your comments were on that, specifically, Brother Daryl. Thank you. You know, I'm not really an expert on this, and uh, I have, and I'm from Minneapolis uh, originally, and my family's up there, and there's a lot of division and discussion about these things. Um, I do also know a little bit about the relationships that we had with the police unions in Wisconsin, and they weren't always the best in some ways. And I think, and I don't really want to go too far into this. We've got other things to talk about, but uh, I do hope that the new Biden administration, and more than that, I think at the local level, you know, we've got 18,000 different police forces and police groups. Uh, I think that, uh, that some reforms are, are really needed, and I think that will help everyone. Anybody else? Ken, can I chat for a minute? It's going to be very brief. Go ahead, Jillian. Thank you. I just feel very honored to be here with you all, like 40 years. That's like immense. That's longer than I've been alive. Um, <laughs> by three years, so I'm getting there. But um, Daryl, am I wrong to think that you wrote something about the milk strikes? in the Wisconsin there, Magazine of History. There's a, there's a, there's a section in my book, uh, Workers and Unions in Wisconsin, that is on the milk strike, yes. And some great images, some great photos. Thank you, I drew on that for my dissertation. So I just, Joanne, thank you. Judy, Harry Miller, Shell, this is very honored to be here with you all. Okay, anybody else? Excuse me for being awkward here. This old man has a terrible cramp in his thigh. So, anybody else? And if if not, uh, uh, Shell or uh, Harry or Joanne, do you have anything further to say before we move on? No, I think it was a very stimulating uh, a discussion, and I hope that I hope most of you do agree with that. Uh, and I, I think we have, uh, and, and thank you, Daryl and Shell and uh, Harry and Joanne for your congratulations on the society's 40th, 40th anniversary. So uh, Steve, I think we can- Again, Let me just say- uh, Go ahead, Shell. Keep it going for the next 40 years and uh, we're all looking to you and uh, for an example of how we can do the same thing in our own communities. So congratulations. I would, I would, I would like to say that uh, we have joined on at the inspiration of folks from the Pacific Northwest Labor History Association uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Larry Spivak of, 
of the Illinois Labor History Society to form and have started, some of you have, have, have been part of those meetings, the, the Labor History Collaborative or Network for the United States and Canada. And so uh, we had a forum uh, in March, we had 118 people show up and it looks like a pretty good beginning for this, uh, for this group because we are trying to spread the role that, that labor and worker history have in our society. Uh, as you all know, when we went through high school, we learned about Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller. And uh, who's this guy, Gompers? And so on and so forth. And we also never really found out that if there were plumbers and, uh, and, and industrial workers who, who have made history. And we're, we want to keep that in the forefront. So with that, I think we'll close this section of our meeting and start our annual meeting. And Steve, go ahead now, and, and I'll put the agenda up on the screen. And be, before any of you uh, leave, uh, I just want to uh, pick up on uh, uh, what Jillian just mentioned, uh, because Jillian helped us uh, formulate the, the uh, theme and uh, get our speaker for our upcoming fall conference. We've moved the conference away from this spring into uh, the fall, November 6th, Saturday, November 6th is our tentative date here in Milwaukee. And um, she's uh, contacted Naomi Williams from Rutgers, who has agreed to be uh, one of our, our keynote speakers. And she'll be talking about uh, progressives, populists, and socialists and their role in building a just and fair nation. So we're sort of continuing the, the theme um, that all of you have talked about and uh, making history relevant. Uh, each year when we plan our, our conferences, we try to look forward and say, what challenges will labor be meeting uh, in the coming year? And then we pick a topic that draws on history that helps inform us on how to how to sort of look at that particular uh, topic and, and uh, equip people to participate in that discussion and whatever action is going on around that. So thanks a lot, Jillian. Um, in fact, if we go back and look at our uh, recent conferences that we've had, uh, many of our younger board members uh, have been instrumental in picking the topic and helping us uh, identify speakers. And so uh, having a diverse board, uh, both in terms of ages and, and uh, races and unions uh, certainly helps us, I think, uh, continue to be uh, vibrant as an organization. So, um, I think that's it in terms of transition. So we'll commence with our membership meeting. Certainly any of you um, uh, who are not members right now who are participating today are welcome to continue uh, to join us. And we'll start out with a financial report. And as Judy, I think is on, uh, Robin was unable to uh, be with us, I think, today. and Yeah, actually, I think I will be probably uh, doing that. I was just going to bring it up on the screen if I can find right. it. Uh, this well, is... Ken's, well, Ken's finding it. I think uh, those of you who, uh, who maybe have not participated in our meetings recently uh, will be pleased to see that we continue to be financially uh, uh, vibrant and uh, our membership base continues to grow and uh, uh, Ken's report will certainly uh, reflect that. Yeah, if we can 
if we can, we can find it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I had enough. I thought I had this all prepared for everything, you know, but it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. I have it in an email, Ken. But I, I do have it now. Thank you much. Uh, Thanks, Judy. Okay. Well, I thought I had it. <laughs> okay, bring it up then. I'll try. I'm sorry about that. While you're doing that, why don't I just skip down and, and talk a little bit about the minutes? Yeah. Um, okay. And then when you when you uh, when you find it, let me know, and we'll just pick up. Who was it that said they had it and we're going to bring it up? What's that? No, I can't. I can't. Oh, oh, Judy. Judy. Judy Gatlin. No, Judy B. No. Judy B. Pardon. Okay, I'll, I'll make I'll make you a co-host, Judy. No, wait, wait. I gotta find it. It's in my email. Oh, I'll... then oh, that's yeah. all right. I had it, and it just won't come up properly. Oh, I got it here. Uh, Steve, did you hear my comment or not? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. That's okay. If our dues are paid up, we can comment and or vote. Yes. Even if we don't live in Wisconsin. Of course. Oh, yes, by all means. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, are you going to have a chat open after the meeting, by the way? We you can. and or Ken or both? Or... Sure, we can do oh, that. We, can, we mm -hmm. can stick around, sure. I had yeah, a couple absolutely. things I wanted to say that I, I, I uh, waited on. OK. They're more personal. Sure. All right, here is, here, is the, here is the budget, which reflects our financial strength right here. You'll see on the, on the, uh, uh, on the income side, We've got the 2020 actual, and uh, and we had budgeted up to 28. We only we got, but but a lot of that is due to the to the the way we collect our dues. Our our dues come due at uh, the end of the year, but we continue to collect well into the succeeding year because, as you can see, in 2020 actual. We had 12,800 paid in dues and already 3,320. And, and this was as of uh, uh, January. I, no, I think it was updated uh, uh, in April. And then as you look down. This to, is Ken. I'm sorry, who's? Ken, yeah. these, this is the last one I put together right up to what I, before I came out here. Yeah, yeah, that com that comes up to to early April, right? And uh, so, you, as as you can see, if you look at the actual expenses for 2020 versus what we uh, brought in, uh, we were a little behind. Uh, but as it as it begins this year, it does look like. And we have got the budget set up here, as which you can see the annual conference. Uh, we hope to hold it in person and we gain about $4,000 in income if we hold an in-person thing. And, uh, and based on, on that, uh, we, uh, we have had extremely good success thanks to, to many locals and labor councils throughout the state, some 70 of them contribute every year into our labor history in the schools for Lori Wormter runs runs the legacy fund and has been getting at least over a thousand dollars each year and that helps pay for the Zeidler award uh, awards for graduate and undergraduates of papers on Wisconsin history and uh, the expenses uh, our show show there. Uh, the, of course, major expense is on personnel, and uh, and you know basically, Judy gets fifty five hundred dollars a month for maintaining the books, the, doing all of the uh, all of the data upkeep, uh, 
uh, getting membership mailings out and 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 the and the whole works, and uh, so that's that's part of it. I get two hundred dollars for 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 my few services, and then uh, last year we did employ an intern from the University of Wisconsin Journalism School to do some writing for us. We got six hundred. That's the major cost we got. So that's the. Uh, that's the budget for 2021 in up front of you. So I guess there we need a motion to pass. pass is, there a mo the, uh, is there a motion to uh, approve or any discussion? Gatlin, motion to approve the financial report as presented. Is there a second? I'd second it, but then I have a question. Go ahead. Who set Germanson's rate so low? It's <laughs> <laughs> a it's a labor of love. <laughs> Everything he, he's been doing. I think he insisted on it. Is I a, a love of labor. <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> it, it, I mean. Can you can you afford to give him a little more? He didn't ask me to do this. In fact, he no. Meant, I, I, I you know if, if you'd why like so to. little? For well, all I, I think to be honest with you, I don't want any more, John. And uh, it, as uh, uh, Steve said, I get great compensation just 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 working with all the all the great folks that I've known through the years. Well, as you said, it, I will be. Uh, criticized for being sexist. You're such a sweetheart. It's just amazing <laughs> all that you've done for Wisconsin and labor history across North America. Yeah, here, here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, anything else? All right. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion's carried. And then while we're waiting uh, for the, um, uh, while I'm, I'm gonna address the issue of the uh, minutes and while we're doing that, Ken, if you could bring up the president's report. Sure. And then I'll, uh, I'll be ready to talk about that. So uh, we have a new, um, we have a new secretary and um, uh, so uh, our outgoing secretary, unfortunately, uh, ha has not um, uh, been able to, you know, put together the minutes from last year's meeting. And so what we do have is a recording and uh, people who are interested in certainly uh, listening to last year's meeting, uh, we're welcome to share that uh, link and recording with you. And so um, I don't, unfortunately, have uh, uh, minutes uh, to approve here. Okay. Um, any further discussion or questions about that? All right. And our new secretary, by the way, is Jacqueline Kelly. And she is from the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees and has been doing uh, our social media and I've uh, been uh, active with us uh, as a volunteer uh, for a couple of years now. And so we're really pleased to have her on our board. So anyway, uh, in terms of uh, the president's report, that's a good transition into it is that, you know, we really are uh, who we are and successful because we have such an incredibly active uh, board and um, they do shape uh, they do they do shape um, everything we do uh, it's very participatory and um, and uh, we enjoy our meetings uh, enjoy our conversations and the collegiality that uh, comes with uh, both so uh, just in terms of, I'll go briefly over, you know, what we've done for the year. Uh, again, uh, our 40th 
uh, anniversary conference I've covered. Uh, we'll be deferring that uh, to November 6th. I mentioned what the topic is, um, the 2020 conference. Unfortunately, we had to um, uh, cancel that due to the pandemic. Uh, we continue to give our, our uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. And last year's award went to State Senator uh, Dave Hansen, from, Democrat from Green Bay. And uh, you may know that he helped author the uh, Labor History in the Schools Act that made labor history part of the state's uh, school curriculum. Um, archives, uh, I think Daryl will be happy to know that we're continuing to uh, work on uh, uh, curating those archives and putting them together. And, and uh, so uh, there's been a lot of work done on that actually over the last uh, past year. In terms of the mapping project, uh, we inherited a mapping project from uh, Scuffle, the Madison uh, Area Labor Council, and uh, uh, we've uh, continued to do some work on that uh, in the past year and hope to get that up uh, in our next year. Our website, we did a major, uh, some major revisions on our website this past year. And uh, we have still a few things to do on it, but please check it out. Uh, made it much more easy to work with and uh, also to join as a member. Bayview Tragedy, um, this year, last year we did it on May, um, uh, last year we did it virtually and we're going to do the same thing this year. We'll stream it live. Um, or our event for this year will be on May 2nd. And it looks to be exciting. And uh, uh, we put that together with the uh, Bayview Historical Society as well. Uh, plays a role in that. And you can scroll down a little bit. In terms of labor history in the schools, uh, we've continued to do our outreach with students uh, uh, through both our uh, labor history essay contest and National History Day. Uh, much of this work helps uh, young folks uh, talk with uh, their uh, parents and family members uh, about their own histories in the labor movement and pass those lessons on uh, from generation to generation. And so it's very rewarding work, uh, continues to be rewarding work. And, um, and we're happy to have that relationship uh, with the State Historical Society as well. The uh, Frank Zeidler Academic Awards, um, again, uh, thanks to um, uh, Vice President Wormter, uh, uh, we're, we're, we continue to have a a very vibrant legacy fund. And um, uh, we'll be doing, uh, we, we note there that the winner of the uh, graduate award uh, last year was Alani Shermer, a doctoral student from the University of Wisconsin. And uh, we'll have several awards this year. And those awards uh, we will present at our November 6th uh, conference. Our membership is up and growing. Uh, so um, thanks again to the organizing work of board members. Um, we've talked about Steve Meyer and, and Michael and our loss there. And uh, looking ahead, um, uh, we'll be doing, uh, we have a, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Jacqueline Kelly is uh, our new board member and um, and uh, we'll be doing a lot of interesting work, uh, certainly with us in the future year. So that's, um, uh, that's it for, the, for a summary of our, of our work. Is there a motion to accept the president's report?
I'll make a motion to accept the president's report. This is Jessica. Jess Gibson. That one second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion is carried. And our next item, Futures Committee report from Jacqueline Kelly. Yeah, Jacqueline, I'm going to bring it up, but just start. Sure, sure. Okay, um, so Labor History Society Board convened a Futures Committee um, to start thinking about, you know, the future um, of the organization to ensure that it remains strong and vital and solvent and everything into the future. Um, the folks on the committee included, let me just scroll through here. Um, Steve, uh, obviously, Joanne Rica, myself, Lori Wormter, David Newby, Jillian Jacklin, Ken Germanson, and Beth Joswiak. I don't think I'm forgetting anybody. That's it. Who's attending those meetings. Um, we met several times through the end of the end of last year and the beginning of this year, and we developed um, several recommendations um, that, that the committee felt would help keep the organization strong. Um, so I will just run through them here. Can you know, actually, I think I have, I can screen share. Oh, I've got well. it up here. Oh. It just, uh, I'm, my screen is loaded up and I'm, so just, uh, just give me a second and I'll, I'll be okay. Sure. I'll just start talking through them and then folks can yeah. read them once and, um, puts yeah. it up on the screen. Um, the first one was to, the first recommendation was to revamp the mission statement. Um, and that was tackled by Jillian Jacklin, Beth Joswiak, and Lori Wormter. Um, the draft statement that they created was endorsed in principle with some changes suggested. And the subcommittee is going to further consider revising the statement. The second recommendation was um, creating a membership committee to become active in an ongoing way to review the means of attracting new and younger members, um, as well as to consider ways to gain more organizational members. Um, the recommendation included naming a chair to ensure that this work continues in an ongoing way and including tasks such as review list of delinquent members and develop list to contact those folks, developing lists of prospective new members, promote fundraising through memorial gifts, and at each meeting, report and discuss. And this was approved. Um, another recommendation was to um, create funding levels uh, within the Datesman Fund up to $1,000. Um, and so the action was for the board to continue the following motion of grants up to $1,000 may be awarded under the Rose and George Datesman Local Labor History Grant Program. And the awarding of each grant would be made by an agreement of the majority of the board. So those grants that are can be distributed out to organizations or individuals around the state to support their research and, and um, presentation of labor history, of local labor history. Um, the next recommendation was to amend the bylaws to slightly increase the higher levels of dues. Um, so to increase the sustaining level to $55 and the solidarity level to $105. Um, and the bylaws change would be recommended at the annual meeting. The next recommendation is to create a volunteer chair um, that would include also creating a committee and the work of the chair and committee would be to identify possible jobs for volunteers and to publicize those volunteer opportunities um, and recruit folks to do them and providing further information about these opportunities like the time frame and the skills required and whatnot. Um, that action was approved. The next recommendation was to explore the development of an endowment fund. Um, 
as well as the consideration of a fund drive to help uh, fill up the endowment fund. Um, the action is for this motion to be considered in the future. Um, and there were there was also some discussion regarding where some other items in the Labor History Society budget could perhaps allocate some money into this new endowment fund while bearing in mind that money earmarked for specific purposes cannot not be reallocated into the endowment fund. The next recommendation was the establishment of a finance committee to advise on investments and the design of accounts, also do development work, uh, work with donors, um, and exploring um, other options such as CDs. That action was approved. Um, another recommendation was to compile job descriptions for what Ken and Judy are currently doing, are currently doing. Um, and the action was that those job descriptions will be created. Um, another recommend, the next recommendation was to um, review and document the activities of the board committees. Uh, no action was taking on, taken on that yet. The next recommendation was to create um, a timeline of the annual cycle of society functions and activities um, so to ensure that those functions and activities happen in a timely way, regardless of who is currently working or volunteering with Labor History Society at that time. Um, and the committee did already create a timeline and submit it, which was accepted. The next recommendation was to um, further explore interns and work study programs. Um, and the action that was taken was checking into the possibility of working with area schools, um, including the UWM public history program, the Eau Claire public history program. The next recommendation was um, exploring an ex the possibility of hiring an executive director, which includes reviewing what Labor History Society is currently spending on staff, and then what we would need to spend on a part-time executive director so that we have a clear idea of what that will necessitate with fundraising. Um, and then in the discussion portion, it lays out what the personnel cur costs currently are, um, and then what the estimate would be um, if those positions were to transition into something new. Um, and it does note that this would necessitate extra funds probably for, for a new position. Um, the suggestions were to prepare job descriptions for the various positions, which would aid when the time comes in attracting someone for these positions. Um, draw up a job description so that it's ready to distribute when, when it becomes necessary to hire someone. Um, be open to alternate staffing, uh, perhaps attracting someone who'd be willing to start at a lower rate or for fewer hours with the expectation that the position will expand, um, explore uses of volunteers, and the suggestion to hold a special board meeting within six weeks after this annual meeting to consider these specific recommendations. And then the last recommendation was to continue holding forums virtually. And that is the full report of the committee. And I, and I believe, uh, Jacqueline, correct me if I'm wrong, that the full report has to go back to the board for final action, right? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. And so we're, we're presenting it today for information purposes and for any input from people that are are part of our annual meeting. So this is Judy is Gatlin. Any... We need to designate between the two Judys on this board. Some somebody writes Judy and they, it's not designated if it's Judy G or Judy B. So uh, I got you. Yeah. In the chat. Yeah. We appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Any any uh, discussion uh, or comments? All right, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to the next, um, we'll move on to the next uh, agenda item, which is a bylaw change. And the bylaw change that we're considering 
is, is to uh, allow uh, an increase in the sustaining member dues from 50 to $55 and the solidarity dues from 100 to $105 with the provision to provide for donations beyond those amounts if people so desire. Um, there was a, a lively discussion about, about the issue of dues and uh, certainly a resounding uh, uh, decision to keep our basic dues low. Uh, and uh, so the only adjustments that um, came forward in terms of the recommendation were these. So is there, first of all, a motion uh, to go forward with the bylaw change in a second? And then we'll have discussion. I am trying. Move to approve a bylaw change uh, to increase the dues as indicated. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second. Uh, and uh, any further discussion? Sorry, Steve, just to capture it in the minutes. Um, sorry, EJ, what is your last name? Oh, it's Beth Jasmiak. That's oh. Elizabeth. <laughs> Any further discussion? Um, it's Judy over here. Can I raise Burn an it. issue? So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I just have a question about do we want to do this now or would it be better to come up with an idea of how we're going to fund an executive director and then have a vote you know, uh, vote once on changing the due structure instead of doing it now, which isn't going to yield all that much. Um, it might be a good idea to have a small group report back on a due structure. Did I lose you, Steve? Did I do something wrong here? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Sorry, my, uh... Sorry, I had to step away there for a minute. My uh, computer just notified me it was about to go down. So, <laughs> so anyway. Okay. So I, I heard the beginning of Judy's comment, which was, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, where do we set the dues uh, based on what the, you know, what what salary we might set. Uh, and we might want to tie the two together. The, um, uh, you know, I, I think that was certainly part of the discussion um, and people seem pretty determined to make sure they kept the, the lower, you know, our basic dues low. So, um, but, you know, that's it, it, certainly somebody can make a, a motion to amend uh, if they so, so desire. But. I mean, we are we are re required because of action of the board to bring this matter before the annual meeting. Now, the only way we can make bylaw changes, and that's whenever we touch the dues, is we have to change the change our bylaws. So we need a vote up or down on the particular motion. We could amend it at, here and uh, change it. Um, if people were so so desired. Is, is there any amendment? Any Question. further discussion? I'm sorry. Further discussion. This is Judy. What 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 was Jacqueline's futures committee? She had some a point there about the executive director. Wouldn't this wouldn't this activity of what what our annual budget is versus if we get some paid positions, wouldn't that be with fall within that committee? I mean we can we can we can revise the budget at any time 
Well, right. And that's correct. And, and and I think what this bylaw change is looking to the future starting next uh, next year. Uh, I don't expect we'll have any specific personnel needs prior to next year, but you never know, of course. And uh, so I think it is, I think the whole matter of what we want to do about staffing the organization will rest on a decision as how are we going to raise sufficient funds uh, to, to, uh, to pay for, for, for such a person. I think we did figure out in the futures, futures committee report that if you paid a person $20 an hour at, for half time, uh, you'd have, I forget what it is now, around, around 17 or $18,000, or was it more than that? But, uh, but we, don't, we can't afford that now. And so I think uh, once we decide how we're gonna handle you know, the uh, fact of the, the fact of the case is that I am 91 years old and I'm <laughs> quickly running out of steam and uh, it's time for my nap. So <laughs> I think that uh, we need to make, uh, make a choice for the future as, as, to what, as to what we can do, you know, and of course, Judy too. And so uh, should we combine the jobs? Neither one of us view this as a, as a permanent position. I think Judy can speak for herself, but uh, she's in there in here also as a, as a matter of love after her long years of experience in the labor movement. Any further discussion? Pam, sir. Yes. What's, uh, can you put up the screen, uh, the current due structure and this motion? I, I can't easily do that, John, but you know, okay. basically, basically the current due structure is retirees and unemployed, $10 a year. Um, so I, I would change that. That's ridiculous to charge me $10 a year. I'm sorry, it's just, it's, but, um, but anyway, I, I, I would amend that to much more. And do you have a life membership built in? I don't remember. No, we do not. We have, I will run down what our membership is. Retirees, unemployed, $10. Individual membership, $20. Uh, family membership, $30. Sustaining, $50. Solidarity, $100. And, uh, we're only proposing here to raise the sustaining and solidarity by $5. Uh, yeah. This is not a major change. And we do, I think you need a more major change. I'm sorry. We, we do have many retirees though that voluntarily join at the sustaining or you know, higher levels. So. Oh my God, yes. In fact, we are finding more and more uh, people uh, some doing paying dues at the higher levels than pay at either the participant or the retirees. And, <coughs> and yeah, but we kept the $10 in just for, for people having real problems with their cash. I think that's wonderful. But there- I could call the question, please. Yeah. Silly. Question's been called. Um, any objection? No. Nope. All right. All those in favor of the motion? Agreed. Aye. Signify aye. by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay? I oppose. How many no's do we have? Just one. Two. 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 Okay. Motion carried. Um, unless you want to roll call. No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Very funny. <laughs> what union did you come out of that's so democratic? Well, you know, I thought you might want to make the meeting a little longer. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not. I, Ken looks tired. He needs to yeah. nap. All right. 
All right, election of officers. <laughs> now is your opportunity to vote me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. <laughs> <laughs> For a bad sense of humor. <laughs> That's good grounds enough. All right, Judy Gatlin. Thank you, Judy Gatlin, chair of the nominating committee. And we have two board officers positions open, secretary and president. So I will call nominations for president of the Wisconsin Labor History Society. And I believe you can self-nominate as well. Well, I nominate Steve Caperi. Second. Need a second, you got it. Yeah, you don't need a second. You don't need a second, but. Is right. there any other nominations? Is there any other nominations? Is there any other nominations? Do you accept the nomination, Brother Steve? Sure. All right. All those in favor of Steve Capri leading this organization? Right. Signal say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you. I get to hand it over to our new president then, right? Or do I run? You want me to uh, run? I think, I think normally we've had the. Uh, the chair of the committee do the whole. No, she, she slate, can't. Do she? Like, oh, she can't, can't. I can do the secretary, but I'm up for re-election, so. All right. All right. So, do you want to do the secretary or not? Sure. Is there any nominations for secretary? Jacqueline Kelly. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Sister Jacqueline, do you accept the position? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah, I got it finally. Great, great. All those in favor of um, instilling aye. Jacqueline as our secretary, single by with saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, I hand it over to you, Steve. And then we have several board nominations. Do you know how many can be precise? Well, I think Judy has the list there, so she can read them off at least. All right. I do. There's no, 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 Seven. Judy Gatlin. Oh. <laughs> so there's eight, eight board members who um, are up for a two-year term. And I did reach out to all of them, and they all said they would like to run again. Uh, and they are? Chris, Chris Berkeley, okay. Paul Sigler, Judy Gatlin, Jessica Gibson, Jillian Jacklin, Ginger Jefferson, Anita Johnson, and Harvey Kay. All right. Anita, um, Anita and Ginger both were hesitant because they're both really involved with um, getting people registered to vote and they will continue to be involved with that till the next election. But they said they would stay on. I, I encourage them to stay on because we have the virtual meetings and such. So I don't know what we do from there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone? Want to nominate, uh, make a nomination? You could nominate the slate that was just mentioned that have already accepted nomination if someone wants to do that. So, so moved. All right, John. Second? Or you don't need a second, right. Is there any other nominations? Any other nominations for board members? Any other nominations? Hearing none, nominations are closed. Is there a vote to accept uh, and put in place the nominated board members by acclamation? Is there a motion to do so? I make a, mo I make a motion to unanimously vote okay. for all those people on the docket. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, welcome aboard. Looking forward to working with you again. Judy, could you just quick run through that list so I can get it in the notes of those eight folks? How about I send it to you in an email, Jacqueline? That's perfect. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other uh, business before the society? 
Steve? Yes. Hi, Steve. It's Ron Kent. Um, I, I have a suggestion uh, for the board to consider. Uh, um, we have a new uh, superintendent of public instruction. Uh, and I think the society would be well served by setting up a meeting with her to uh, engage her in the labor history in the schools to a higher level. Uh, right now, most of these programs, as I understand them anyway, are voluntary and they vary all over the lot. And I would like to see us maybe have some input with the new superintendent of public instruction who is sympathetic to labor uh, to make those uh, kinds of standards uh, more, uh, how say, uh, foundational, let us say, for elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. And that the curriculum, uh, we could help cr maybe create. Uh, and I know that David Newby's worked on this in the past. I have as well uh, set up uh, a suggested curriculum for teachers, but that also the, uh, uh, the actual method would be that it would be made part of the social studies curriculum at various levels of public education in the state at a more solid level, not just voluntary, but rather maybe foundational. Um, and so I'm asking the board to consider uh, a, an initiative to approach our state superintendent and see if that would be possible. Thanks. Um... Ron, it's interesting you mentioned that because Ken and I were just talking about this last week. Um, my wife uh, is active in terms of uh, AAPI uh, issues in the state. Um, uh, and she uh, has reached out to the chair, or I, I guess she's vice president right now, um, of the social studies uh, organization. Uh, who happens to be a Shorewood teacher. In fact, she was our daughter's teacher. And uh, she's willing to work with them and they've explored what some of the barriers are to getting something li like uh, having um, greater coverage for Asian and Pacific I Islander uh, issues in uh, public schools. And at the same time, we've talked uh, about labor issues. Yeah. And so Ken, um, Ken and I are going to pick this up and uh, we're on it and we appreciate your suggestion and uh, we'll see what we can do and we'll report back to you. Okay. Yeah, th th yeah, thank you, Ron. I just want to add, add something briefly. Uh, we did pass, you know, the law in 2009, the only state that has done something like that, except I guess Connecticut now. But uh, the law did state that uh, the teaching of, of labor history be included in the, uh, in the core curriculum of the state, of, state of, of Wisconsin. And we did establish some, some things like that while, uh, uh, while Governor Doyle was still in the seat. And then frankly, it was going to go forward, but Scott Walker suddenly was there. And to be honest with you, we decided to kind of keep it. So the law is there to do what you say. And uh, we, we did develop a curriculum with the State Historical Society, with, the, with, with, with DPI around 2006 and the state AFL-CIO. And that's still available. So uh, there's a lot of groundwork done. It's a matter of putting a fire in into the new DPI person. And I think that's a great suggestion. And the gov governor's it's, office too. It's a great, it's a great time because she's, you know, new. Yep. You know. Yeah, and, um, absolutely. I think that that would really help promote our hit essay contest 
and um, history day projects. Absolutely. And I, I think yep. uh, uh, Jim Cavanaugh has done a wonderful job of uh, putting together a uh, set of curriculum for teachers. And uh, I just want to pay credit to, to him for his outstanding uh, work in that area. And David Newby has done uh, yeoman work as well here. And uh, I think uh, I, I just want to urge you to continue on that path of using these great resources that we have uh, to bring history, especially film. It's another thing we have to, uh, to uh, it's a visual culture. And I think that uh, we have to pay attention to films that grab the attention of students on the question of labor history. And I, I'm sure David Knack is listening and he does uh, has a whole series of films that he uses in his teaching, but I think the, the idea would be to integrate greater amounts of uh, visual uh, kinds of elements into the curriculum. So thank you for considering this suggestion. Great suggestions. Yeah, we'll make sure and follow up with it. I think as Kent mentioned, you know, one of the, our, our big concern is when the Republicans control both the assembly and the Senate and the governor's office, we were very concerned that they just strip the law, you know, take it out. And so um, uh, we didn't want to give them the opportunity to do it <laughs> given, given everything else they had done. So, uh, but now is the time to move. So thank you. Thank you so much for bringing this up and having this discussion. Any other, any other items we should talk about? Judy G, did you have something? No, I just, I'm just getting all excited about this. Okay. <laughs> so, you, so you're saying, so you're saying, if I understand it, you're saying, you know, you don't want to bring this to the attention of our Republican controlled administration. No, mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, now, I think now is fine because we do have a governor, right? Who can veto. Yeah. Yeah. And we do, and we do have a DPI. Uh, but okay. in, in the in the discussion that uh, my wife Lorna has had, uh, you know, with the other topic, uh, Walker did put in place some barriers to mm -hmm. implementing um, the kinds of progressive education that we'd like mm -hmm. to see in schools, mm -hmm. not just labor, but also with respect to, um, you know, Asian studies, et cetera. So, I did not know that. I did yeah. not know that. I know mm -hmm. we had Act 43. I believe that's the number for uh, yeah, basically as a, people. Yeah, as I understand it, um, despite the fact that there is an act, he's he's also um, put in place um, uh, provisions that just allow local school districts to make up their own mind in terms of what mm -hmm. to do in terms of education. Now I got more to dislike him about. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank so. you. So anyway, and that's blocked, that's blocked, um, you know, uh, education in African American studies and all sorts of other things as well. So it's not, it's not just us that's uh, impacted by this. So, and there's a number of strategies that um, other organizations have used through the Wisconsin Association of School Boards uh, to try and get things done. I don't know that that is going to work for us. <laughs> in terms in terms of the school boards association but um uh but there are other strategies and we do have certainly a good ally in terms of our lieutenant governor um uh, uh, in terms of moving things too so so thanks so much for the discussion anything else if nothing is there a motion to adjourn Although I'd like to ask you one small little question, a parochial one. Did you get the book that I sent to you uh, on Dublin Lockout 1913? Yep. You did get it. That's great. Okay, thank you. Any yeah. other discussion? And we'll keep the uh, chat. We'll 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 keep the uh, whatever we're doing here open for sure. a while because I know a couple of you wanted to carry on conversations after the meeting. Make a motion to 
Adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing you at our conference in November and at our future meetings. All the permitting. All, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Meetings adjourned. Thank you. Yay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. You. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around. <laughs> so, uh, John, I think you wanted to have something to say. I don't know if anybody else did, but uh, but we're I here. imagine you're exhausted. Um, Steve's pretty young compared to you and I. So, uh, one, it let other people go first, but I did have too many things. And we could redo something another time. It doesn't have to be now. And you could see me slouching because I'm ready for my nap. Okay. Well, um, anyway, but I, I do have a list of things, and I would just as well do some of it now. But not if, not if you guys are... I. I did a Zoom yesterday, and so I understand being exhausted after. Well, anyway, you you did uh, put something in the chat about the 100th anniversary of Workers' Education Local uh -huh. 189, and, oh, yeah. uh, and, you know, Brookwood College, which was founded, I think, in 2020. I mean, in 20, 1920. No, 1922. Oh, 22, oh, okay. 100th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. can go first, but I was going to let Eddie and you got Hugh also there. So does anybody else have anything to say before? I guess not. So, okay, John, that's it then. So, uh, but you did, you did. Uh, yeah, I, I did like that and I had other notes. I can go as quick as possible. Yeah, just, just, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. You know, I'm not quick. Yeah, but you got to be quick now. <laughs> You're tired. So no, anyways, okay. um, I helped coordinate an event yesterday, a Zoom event. It's similar number, but it changed over the two hours we did it <clears throat> of who was there, of people who work mostly, well, union and university worker and labor educators. We did kind of a reunion and preparation for 100th anniversary of Brookwood Labor College and Worker Education Local 189 coming up next year. So I wanted to let um, a couple of you know that's in the works. And um, if, if you know labor film at all, you know there was a movie about the Flint sit down strike called With Babies and Banners. Right. And Lynn Goldfarb, a friend who at one point lived in Michigan, um, helped make that. And we talked recently about maybe looking into whether or not we could do something in preparation or out of this 100th anniversary. Yeah, that's a, that would be a good idea. And, and it might be something that our, our US Canada uh, group could 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 work on yeah mm -hmm. good thought so that was one and thing i was going to say the U uaw um, might join us on that too why? I, mean, they, I said the uaw might join us on that too john drew has um you know done some joint uh projects with us well uh, so we, among the 40 people that were part of this zoom i coordinated which mm -hmm. was kind of a reunion for uh worker ed local 189 ucla and UAL leaders Mm -hmm. um, was Dave Elsula. Mm -hmm. Kenny would know well because they both were editors of their international union papers. Yeah, I know Dave, of course. Yeah, I remember him. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he's still active in the Michigan Labor History Society, which I mentioned earlier, uh -huh. kind of grew out of the Illinois one. Um, if any of your historians were still here, I was going to tell them... Um, Commons is so important and there's no reason to apologize for commons or 
any of his colleagues and what was done with Commons and what suppose Perlman, Eli, a, a lady named Liz Brandeis. I don't know if she's related to Louis. Anyway, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wisconsin labor movement and the labor history stuff out of Wisconsin is like, it's so important in American unionism and labor history. You yeah, that was, uh, that was the kind of the point that uh, we were trying to make there that this all kind of a lot of it started with with people like Commons and the Wisconsin labor movement and this, the strong socialist and progressive combination, which they didn't mention the fact that we got that progressive legislation done by a uh, by a collaboration be, between the progressives who are basically rep Republican and rural and the socialists uh, who were urban and labor. And uh, so that's why we got some of that revolutionary stuff done in the early 20th century. So, um, but anyway, I think- not, not For a long time, the new left historians didn't appreciate how important that was. I mean, if you look at it in comparison to today, labor was barely existent at the time Commons and all those folks were writing, which is kind of like anybody writing about labor history today. Oh, right. Well, anyway. So anyway, I'll move right along. I'm almost done. Um, so a, 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 an offshoot is this history of labor education, worker education, and Wisconsin School for Workers was major in this. Nice. That's where I got my training. I think it's by my visits with them and with the AIW that I get to know Germanson and all kinds of people. And um, I think Michigan benefited a lot. So I'm almost done. I'll, I'll quit. That's okay. Well, listen, that's all bear. You know, that's that's you know, that's true. And I think. Yep. I, th I think you made the point. Well, okay, this was. Good point. I think it would turn out to be a halfway decent meeting if even if the even if the technology was screwed up. <laughs> oh, Penny, I, I so I told you I did this Na North American conference of worker education, local 189 UCLA and UALE leaders as a kind of reunion and, and, and getting prepared for 100th anniversary and what might me do. And um, fifth, uh, a few minutes before the end, I got tapped out. Yeah. Uh, and I was gone because I hadn't paid